All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's the top of the hour, and we're going to go ahead and get started with um, our journal club today. Um, so the Florida Medical Directors Association is proud to bring back journal club uh, for 2022. Uh, thank you for allowing us to take a brief break and unaware that it was going to be a surge <laughs> with another wave of a different variant, um, Omicron, which we're going to talk about. So today, in thinking about where we go and how, how we have these conversations, I wanted to start the mm -hmm. year off with a pharmaceutical update. And um, we have a group of experts who I will introduce shortly. I'm very excited just to hear what they have to say about some of the issues. But as we always do, whenever we're doing a COVID update, I wanna start with the state of the state. And I am very aware, and I think we're all very aware of where we're at as a, um, a country and as a state with um, COVID. I will say that when, you know, part of the, I, I was telling Shane that, um, this morning that it felt a little surreal, not only because we haven't um, met with the, everyone since November, but we are all experiencing this wave and it really took a toll on our healthcare um, teams uh, a little bit differently than it did um, before. Um, knowing that I that we couldn't get labs not only drawn because the the lab techs were out, can't get an X-ray done because the radiology techs are are out. Um, having trouble um, staffing our building because there's so much turnover in having our physicians and our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants out of the buildings, our pharmacists out of the buildings, it's been a little bit more um, challenging. And I've seen it from every aspect. I think um, um, every one of my associates, either they had a breakthrough infection with COVID um, or they were being quarantined because they were exposed. So I think we're all feeling this a little bit differently. When we look though at the um, level of community transmission, you know, Omicron tends to be um, highly transmissible, and we're seeing that still across the country. This is um, this was last updated um, on Monday, January seventeenth, and this is from the CDC. So we still see a high um, transmission rate throughout um, the country, throughout Florida. It is. It is getting better. And when we look at um, where the, the forecasting is going, we do see that in the next um, few weeks, we're anticipating that the numbers will uh, drop as far as new cases in the state of Florida, as well as across the country. But what does that mean for nursing homes? So I was looking at some nursing home data that we have. And um, this again is from um, the National Healthcare Safety Network, which has their dashboards um, right there on the CDC's um, site. And when we're looking at how we um, are seeing the, the, the transmission amongst our, our residents, it is important to note that that green line that you see at the bottom represents those nursing home residents who have had a booster. So we do see breakthrough infections with those who've been vaccinated with this variant. We see, um, of course, those who are unvaccinated having um, a significant um, rise in infections. But I, I do want to appreciate the fact that with that booster, um, um, that those case rates is 10 times lower among the, those groups. When we look at it a little bit further though, uh, one concern that I had was that in Florida, when we're looking at residents who have been boosted, we're still, um, as of um, the week of the 9th of January, we still see that that rate is um, a lot lower than we would like at 46.3%. When we go and look at what's happening with our um, staff, that um, those boosted rates are even lower. So we're seeing um, somewhere around, I believe 20.3% of the staff as reported through the 9th of um, January being boosted in the nursing home. So it, it, there is a lot of work that we still have to do. There are a lot of things that we still have to educate our staff on and we're, we're still seeing those challenges. But as I said, where I wanted to start today was to really dive in and um, talk about some of the, the 
things that we have going on in the pharmaceutical um, space because that's where a lot of encouraging news is, is um, at, in my opinion. <laughs> and having gone through uh, the wave that we're still um, riding with um, the variant, having had uh, COVID really collide into our home and and, um, and see how that is with all the breakthrough infections. I'm <laughs> one, the one thing that gave me hope was seeing uh, the, the pharmaceuticals and and um, trying to understand what this is all mean. I think there's a lot of questions around um, vaccinations and um, fourth shots and boosters in the future, as well as um, still challenges with monoclonal antibodies. So that's where we're gonna go. And I want to introduce our panel because I'm very excited. And then um, I'm going to stop sharing so that we can all get on the screen. Uh, let's do that first. All right. So tell me when you can see. Yes, perfect. Everybody's here. So first, I'm going to introduce Corey Bishop. She's an effect, an effusion nurse specialist for Omnicare Pharmacy Services. She serves as the National Director of Effusion Nursing for Omnicare Effusion Services for the past 15 years and holds national certifications in both effusion therapy and rehab nursing. Um, Corey, I'm gonna stop there because I could keep reading your bio for days. Um, Jenny Orr is the clinical manager for the Southern half of Florida for Omnicare, a CVS health company, has worked in long-term care industry for 20 years. As clinical manager, she is responsible for overseeing the clinical um, services. This includes managing the consultant pharmacists, implementing clinical programs, managing facility formulary, and providing education to customers and staff. And then um, Terry O'Shea, Terry, your bio is huge too. He attended the University of Cincinnati College of Pharmacy where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy degree in 87 and a Doctor of Pharmacy degree in 92. And he is currently the Director of Consultant Performance for Omnicare, a CVS health company. So I wanna welcome all three of you here with us. And I know Corey and, and Jenny, you've been here before. Terry, we're all on first name basis. So I'm Diane, everyone is on a first name basis. And we, I really want to just dive into a couple of um, concerns that we have across uh, Florida as well as across the state. So um, what I'm going to do is just ask a couple of questions. So I think no, no big surprises. I want to start with monoclonal antibodies. And just to get your um, opinions and, and any insights you have on what we're seeing in long-term care spaces and post-acute long-term care spaces when it comes to um, obtaining monoclonal antibodies, delivering monoclonal antibodies, and how we're doing that for our residents in the buildings. And that's an open question to whomever wants to take it. Thanks, Diane. This is Corey. I'll take it. <laughs> I've been owning the monoclonal antibody program for a while. So um, I think the situation right now is is a little bit grim in that the only monoclonal antibody that we have available in our space um, that has shown effectiveness against Omicron is um, the citravimab. And unfortunately, it's in very short supply. So if you follow the um, HHS allocation schedule, they're, they're basically only allocating about 50,000 doses across the US every week. So that 50,000 doses has to be distributed between um, the all the US states and our jurisdictions. So we're getting very little citravimab um, you know, filtered into long-term care pharmacies. We continue to work with the states, and I, I know that my my other partners are working with the states to increase the allocation of monoclonal antibody to the long term care space. But um, you know, thus far, there there just isn't enough of it to go around. And, and we did see um, Evasheld that uh, received an EUA. However, Evasheld is being reserved for the severely immunocompromised and the lion's share of that product went to hospitals um, and tertiary care centers for treating patients you know, that have are on chemotherapy or can't get vaccinated. So again, really, really limited supply 
<clears throat> with monoclonal antibodies. Um, so a big, a very different picture than what we saw prior to Omicron come on, come on the scene. Yeah, I remember when we were trying and begging people to to utilize monoclonal antibodies. And then yeah. um, over the summer with Delta, having people be infused in their cars in certain states and in the libraries down here in Florida. So it is a, a definitely a very troubling and concerning picture. Um, do we, with the 50,000 um, doses across the country, when it comes to the state and, and determining like how do we get that to long-term care, what is the advocacy needed? Who, who's our voice um, to those, to our departments of health? You know, I, certainly anybody can help. <laughs> um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking to the different state departments of health. Um, my, my go-to statement is how can you allocate more to a hospital when monoclonal antibody for treatment of COVID isn't indicated in hospitalized patients, which means that the hospitals are administering that in their ambulatory care setting to patients that are ambulatory can walk in and get it. How do you, how do you justify that in not giving the lion's share to long-term care where we have patients living in congregate living who don't have the ability to go there and they are the most vulnerable um, portion of our population. It, that's helped. It certainly helped in the early days to get, you know, plenty of supply. Um, but I think at this point, there's so little supply to go around. The states are really struggling with prioritization. But certainly, you know, anyone can advocate at the State Department of Health to, to get more of um, the monoclonal antibodies to uh, the long-term care pharmacy so that we can treat and service the patients in, in you know, congregate care living. Yeah. And I'm just curious to know, and it, it is okay if you don't have an answer, but in thinking about the future and what's next, you know, after we get over this, you know, the forecasting is projected that we're going to start seeing less cases by mid-February. What then happens as far as what, what do we need to do for our facilities to be prepared for whatever comes next when we're thinking about monoclonal antibodies? Um, is it then that we, I don't know what will happen with the allocation. I don't know what the, what's going to, what's going to be decided, but what do we do to start preparing for whatever is next? Yeah, that's a great question, Diane. Thanks for asking. I mean, I think some of the things that we need to do is, is make sure that our facilities have the capability to administer. Um, and I know that a lot of the manufacturers um, and our partners in manufacturing are working diligently to get you know, um, additional product to market. The government did purchase more citravimab. So we hope to see delivery of that um, in, in the first quarter. Um, Regeneron is working on sort of in addition to their cocktail that will be effective against Omicron. So we just really need to keep people uh, aware um, and, you know, certainly support the long-term care facilities. I mean, you know, the saddest part for, for, for all of this related to Omicron is that we had the Regeneron product that could be given sub-Q. And that was a huge win for long-term care. The IV administration is, is really a heavy lift for our facilities. Their staffing is, is, is difficult. They're using a lot of agencies. So administering IVs is, is a really tough um, decision for them. So when we had the Regeneron product, it was great and we had plenty of it. Um, and now we're sort of back to, I think a lot of our customer, our facilities are are fearful that we're back to the early days in 2020, March, April, May, when there was no treatment and we were just treating symptomatically. So, but that sort of leads us into, we do have other options. Now we have the oral antivirals, right? And I think that is, um, you know, good news on the scene, although they may be in short supply, we do have that as another option. Okay. So hold that thought. <laughs> Let's talk um, next about vaccinations and boosters. Um, you know, I will definitely say when I had my breakthrough infection in December, I was I was like all ready for that fourth shot. I was like, if I could give it to myself as I saw it coming, because it felt like you couldn't you couldn't protect yourself enough to keep Omicron out of your home. And as as we started seeing um, it, despite having boosters, we started having um, 
those breakthrough infections. And I was like, where's this fourth shot? Can I fly to Israel? Can I get it? You know, so what did, what do we, when we hear that and it's all over the news, people are talking about it. What does it mean for our long-term care space? If we are going to try to, to give out fourth shots sometime in the future when, and we still have a, a, a poor uptake of the boosters currently. So what are we thinking about for future state when it comes to the vaccinations? Yeah, this is Terry. I'll go ahead and take that. So, so yeah, I think your point is very well taken in terms of um, boosting with the third, uh, well, with the the current boost or so uh, the third dose for, for most people, um, you know, is got to be on the, on the highest priority list uh, if at all possible right now. Um, so, just this week, as many of you probably saw, um, some very preliminary data and very small numbers of, of folks like 150 um, patients out of Israel. They showed a, a five-fold increase in antibodies with the fourth dose. However, um, there was also a statement made that that is probably not going to be enough to tackle, I guess, is the word they used, Omicron. So again, that's very early, very small number. And, you know, there'll certainly be more. Um, I think the third dose in Israel was um, given kind of en masse in August. So, you know, these folks were given the fourth dose, um, you know, around the December, mid to late December timeframe. And then, you know, of course, still ongoing right now. So I think it remains to be seen. Um, there's also talk about, you know, how many boosters should be given before, you know, there's kind of this, um, you know, waning of the immune response to boosters um, when they're when they're the same vaccine that's given. So more talk is going toward, you know, maybe it's not a fourth booster, maybe it's uh, or a second booster, I guess, a fourth shot. You know, maybe it's time to look at variant specific vaccines or other types of vaccines versus giving the same one, you know, multiple times. That's very interesting. I think um, I, I I would love to know, and I don't know if you know anything more about what would a, uh, you know, how would, I don't even know how we would be targeting for the next variant, but that feels like what we, what we need to do if we're talking about um, vaccinations, because I, and I, I honestly, when I had my third shot, when I had the booster, I felt invincible, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that feeling like, oh, we're done. I'm good. It doesn't matter. I have on my mask. I'm good. But I, I was um, going through that that sickness of seeing everyone in my family who's been boosted, who were able to be boosted, contract um, COVID. It was it was pretty alarming. And I'm like, what do we need to do to be ready for whatever is next? That is that's the, the question. Yeah, and that's the quandary. So I know fairly recently, you know, Pfizer had announced that they, you know, could have a an Omicron specific um, vaccine by March in, you know, quantities. I think they were talking about uh, 50 to 100,000 doses, which, uh, you know, obviously isn't very much. But as you stated, you know, it might be all not all but gone, but but, you know, really not that prevalent anymore if, you know, the numbers drop as they have in other countries. So yeah, it's kind of, instead of chasing our tail, it's staying ahead of it. And um, yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a conundrum because, yeah, um, you know, you've Omicron, we found out very early, it was extremely transmissible and that's good. And maybe the learnings from that are, you know, if another one is identified, another variant's identified, that's that way that, you know, possibly vaccines get, uh, ramped up right away. So again, um, kind of chasing your tail in a way, but we need to, we need to learn from each variant and, you know, develop a strategy to, to stay ahead of it to the extent we can, which is obviously difficult. Good, good. I know that, um, the point was made that we now have medications, real medications <laughs> that are, are for the, the specific treatment of COVID, uh, can you talk about what it means to have um, the Pfizer and Merck drugs, um, Paxlovid, um, which is Pfizer, and I hope I say it right, Monupervir for um, Merck? Can you talk about what that means and how, how do we get access to it? Yeah, um, I mean, I think they're, they're 
uh, definitely game changers, um, specifically the Pfizer products. So Paxlovid, um, access, as Corey said, with the monoclonals access is the, obviously the biggest issue right now. So monoclonals are being allocated by the government weekly for right now. The orals are every on an every other week schedule, at least through January. And obviously, um, production will be ramped up uh, over the next few months significantly. So, so that's a good thing. But, um, you know, just as an example, 100,000 courses of Paxlovid are, you know, were sent to the states January 10th. I think uh, the same number is coming out the 24th. Um, Molnupiravir, uh, the medication that, as we know, um, isn't nearly at, as effective as uh, Paxlovid, unfortunately, is in is in bigger quantities. So the quantities of do, of uh, courses being shipped out are, are around the four hundred thousand um, mark for the, uh, the two week periods in in January. And again, those will ramp up. So, um, but yeah, that it's an issue. A lot of the the courses right now are are being sent to to retail pharmacies and community health centers. And, you know, that's that's certainly understandable. And that really, I think, is another um, another avenue for uh, to advocate to state health departments that really, you know, long term care facilities are are very um, appropriate populations for these medications as well. But, you know, like the monoclonals, just it's a it's a supply issue in in many cases currently. But, yeah, I do think they're um, especially when you're talking about Paxlovid, which, you know, 88 percent reduction in hospitalizations um, per their clinical trials. Very, very significant. Um, yeah. It does have some baggage. So but five days too, so it's, it's a lot different than um, uh, what Merck's um, Met pill is offering, too. You know, that pill burden is something that I worry about when you're thinking about adding another medication. So um, the sure. Paxlovid does seem like a more favorable choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, it's the oral agent with the most baggage, if you will, in terms of our population. Um, renal dosing parameters, uh, drug inter many, many drug interactions. So as most of you, I'm sure know, um, Paxlovid is not a single agent. It's actually two agents. So it's nermatrovir, um, which is the active antiviral in the combination and ritonavir, which is has no antiviral activity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. It's strictly there for pharmacokinetic reasons to increase the serum concentration of nermatrovir, um, and it's the ritonavir component. And, you know, many of you are familiar with uh, that medication used pretty widely, um, at least in, initially in the HIV population. So lots and lots of drug interactions It's, it's as it's a uh, hepatic uh, CYP3A4 inhibitor and um, is also affected by other drugs that induce the 3A4 enzyme. So, you know, really lots, lots of interactions. Um, you know, I may be jumping ahead, Diane, so sorry, but one, one really important thing for, for prescribers to know is that, um, so there are some renal dosing parameters. So those with a uh, GFR between 30 and 60, essentially, they would have a reduced dose. They would only be getting one tablet of the nermatrovir twice a day instead of two. So it's really important, and this is uh, outlined several times in the EUA and also in some, some slides that I've seen from the FDA that when prescribing Paxlovid, the dose of nermatrovir needs to be specified. It needs to either say, you know, one nermatrovir tablet plus one ritonavir tablet twice a day, or, you know, in normal renal function, two nermatrovir tablets plus one ritonavir twice a day. Alternatively, it could be, you know, 300 milligrams nermatrovir plus one ritonavir twice a day. So that would be the full dose and or 150 milligram nermatrovir. So it's really important based on the knowledge of the renal function to specify the dose of nermatrovir. Um, and then of course it is also um, not recommended for use in those with a EGFR of less than 30. So sorry, I rambled there. Oh no, you you were good, and that was a, a question. So I, I we do have a question in the chat, and maybe you could help us with it. Um, are we 
seeing any reasons to not give this medication, and there may be too many negatives, but let me go back. If the person is asymptomatic, if we have a resident who's asymptomatic and we have availability um, for this medication, should we be starting it? I would say, I would say currently, I mean, it's, it's obviously a, it's a risk benefit decision. Is this person really at, you know, very, at this point, I would say, are they at very high risk for disease progression? Again, we're talking January 19th here where there is, is really limited supply. Um, I would, I would more reserve that. Um, and, and actually the EUA stipulates that it needs to be within five days of symptom onset. So it does dictate that they have symptomatic um, and confirmed infection. So yeah, I, I don't believe uh, at this point and certainly by what the EUA says, it's indicated for the asymptomatic population. Thank you for that. And if we're in a state, let's say um, 100,000 were sit, um, you said across the country, right? 100,000 doses? 100,000 co 100, courses of therapy, yes, yeah. for, for Paxlovid. So how do we in the um, how are our long term care pharmacies um, expected to advocate for distribution to them when it's going to retail pharmacies? What do we need to do to um, for, for that advocacy so that we can get this medication distributed to us as well as um, maybe some of these retail um, pharmacies? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, I think as it, as Corey had suggested, um, you all know your state contacts, and maybe it's worth, and uh, maybe you've done this already, but you know, maybe it's worth uh, getting on a call with them, some representatives from um, FMDA as well as the Florida chapter of ASCP. Um, you know, I wouldn't have forty people on the phone, but you know, just a, a kind of a small contingent of, of leaders. And, and really advocate for, you know, especially in light of that there will be increasing quantities available in the months ahead. And really, um, you know, this is this is one of the, the ripest, if you will, populations uh, for the, you know, these, I'll say these agents, you know, um, molnupiravir, it's, um, it's markedly less effective, at least in the clinical trial than Paxlovid yet. Um, it's in greater supply. So, you know, I guess I would I would take 30% um, efficacy versus not being able to give anything. So it, it's kind of in the in the hierarchy that the NIH, uh, uh, the treatment hierarchy, um, it's actually it's actually last. But, um, you know, given availability of the other agents, it might be the only agent available. And really, you know, for our populations, it's. Um, I don't want to say it's it's clean. It's um, it's not got drug interactions, contraindications um, for really for our population. The the big worry, obviously, is um, folks of uh, women of childbearing potential and, um, you know, sexually active males um, with um, partners of childbearing potential. Uh, it, it seems clean because there's no interactions listed and really no contraindications. Uh, that's that's because there weren't any identified, uh, really. So again, a relatively small study. Um, as more use comes out, there'll be more information about potential drug interactions and things. It's just um, Paxlovid was studied more extensively, uh, looking at that obviously because of the ritonavir component. Um, and then you know they also did an actual pharmacokinetic study to look at the renal uh, dosing issue where. Um, you know, Merck did not do that, at least to date. Yeah. And I, I was asked the question um, privately outside of um, this meeting about our staff and should we just be trying to advocate for having this on hand so that if our staff is sick, we are able to treat them and get them the treatment that they need so that we can bring them back to um, to work sooner. I don't know if you um, have had any discussions or any thoughts about um, that. Uh, I, I'm just curious, you know, to pick your brain. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, it's, it's obviously it's obviously a concern. Um, I would say where we are now, it's really not an option just because of the scarcity. Um, certainly over time, it's uh, 
something that might be worth thinking about. I I don't know that I'd advocate for, you know, putting it in emergency kits necessarily. Um, just again, it, we might come to that when there's a uh, pretty widespread availability, but, but not currently. Um, again, yeah, r- risk benefit in, in many cases, the, the higher risk population is going to be the residents uh, versus the staff. But uh, I obviously see the need and the concern for that. And we'll get to that, I believe, um, but just not, not currently. Thank you. I also, I wanted to know, and um, I'll open this up for everyone. If, you know, thinking about the day in, day in, day in, day out work of um, what you do as a long-term care pharmacist, what are some key takeaways that we need to understand and, and, and challenges that you're seeing just trying to practice currently in, in the environment that we have now? And maybe I can start with Jenny because I haven't gotten her voice in yet. <laughs> No, I brought the experts with me today. Um, I think you have a a very valid point. And I was sitting here thinking when Terry and Corey were talking that this is a great opportunity for that interdisciplinary team to really work together in our long-term care setting. Things change daily, and it's really, really hard to keep up on what agents are available, what's the proper dose, how do I get access to it? And so making sure the consultant pharmacists are communicating with the medical directors, the directors of nursing, the nurses themselves, and vice versa, so that everybody is on the same page, so that when you have a patient who needs treatment, you know, we know what's available, and um, you know the resources that you can reach out to. The consultant pharmacists are a great resource to provide the creatinine clearance or the GFR for all the patients. I know when flu season rolls around, our whole team um, has been instructed to provide the GFRs, the creatinine clearance of every resident in the facility so that the facility has that available for dosing, you know, not only these new agents coming up, but um, agents for treating flu also. Um, so if anything, in the past two years, I've learned, I think, you know, once we we kind of get into our practice and the more we've done it and a lot of us are over 20 years, you kind of just get into a routine and not a whole lot changes. And then when we have something like coronavirus, um, COVID-19, you realize how things change daily and you really need to make sure that you're up to date on um, the most important information and the agents that are available. So I'm thankful that I have a team that I work with that keeps me up to date. And I think it's it's just so important for us to really engage all the players in the long-term care setting um, to make sure everybody has the most up-to-date information. Now, are you, would you say that, it, um, like how's the staffing challenges that we're seeing impacting what you do on a day-to-day basis? You know, I know how it's impacting us and the fact that you may <laughs> give it an order and the person who you gave that order to, you don't, don't see again <laughs> because they were ages. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing? We're seeing a lot of training that needs to be done. Um, a lot of the staff that are coming in may not have any long-term care experience. And I think that's something that maybe we've taken for granted in the past. And so um, I know with my team, every time we have a call, And even the request I'm getting from them is just kind of a back to basics education that's needed. Um, Simple things like, what do I do if I don't have a medication available? Or who do I call if I need a medication? So we're having to re-educate, so to speak, um, the staff every month that we're in facilities because it could be a completely new staff from one month to the next. Uh, so that's a large component of it. And so you take that and then you add on top of that an ever-changing, um, you know, pandemic that's going on. So you're having to educate on that as well. Um, simple things, I, you know, you and I talked yesterday about, um, not to jump, you may ask this question in a minute, but are we seeing long haulers in the nursing home? And I hadn't even thought about it. Because, you know, we have a frail geriatric population and those long hauler symptoms, how do we differentiate if that's due to COVID or if that's just the natural progression of a disease state? So we really need to be tuned into um, the patient and 
looking for signs and symptoms and documenting those. The documentation is super important right now. If nurse A is not going to be here again because she's agency, well, when nurse B comes in, she's going to need excellent documentation so she can know what kind of history this patient has. Because if not, you're just starting over each day. Um, so there's just so many moving parts. Um, that we just really have to kind of remind ourselves about. Um, and again, it's those basic things like you, whatever you see, you need to put in a note. So somebody following behind you, whether it be a nurse, a physician, a pharmacist, also understands what's going on with the patient. Yeah, and I think it's a um, a great opportunity uh, to to partner with the long term care pharmacy pharmacists in your facilities because to your point about long haulers and what we discussed um, earlier in prep, I think that if you're seeing maybe someone who say they have COPD and maybe they are, you know, they're utilizing medications differently, utilizing um, the PRN differently. That may be that they've had either a worsening of their condition or something else is happening. And it would be nice to partner and have a conversation and have those discussions. So I'm going to open it up to um, the, the, the call. I know we have a lot of participants. If you don't um, feel comfortable taking yourself off a of mute, you could always enter um, a question into the chat, but definitely want to hear in, from you guys and um, get any questions that we haven't addressed answered. Um, and while you are thinking about your question, I will just keep um, picking everyone's brain because I, I, I'm just curious, um, what do we, you know, I think in 2020, I was like, okay, what have we learned? And then 2021, I'm like, what have we learned? But for, for now, we're, we're here, still in the pandemic, still in this moment. What do we need to do um, next? What, what do we need to do to make sure we are um, tightly adhered with our long-term care pharmacists in our buildings and, and advocating correctly? You know, what would you recommend in, in each of you? I, I, I would love to hear from you. Sure. I just think, as, as you mentioned, Diane um, and Jenny as well, it's, it's, it's a great time for um, increased levels of collaboration between, um, you know, certainly medical directors, but um, other prescribers as well and um, nursing leadership to, you know, have that collaboration and, and um, increased level of interaction and partnership with the consultant pharmacist who can be really a great, a great resource Um you know, four questions that come up regarding potentially regarding access, um, regarding uh, potential clinical scenarios that these drugs may be used in. Um, you know, one thing that I, I hate to jump the gun and somebody will probably have a question related to this, but one thing we haven't uh, really discussed yet is remdesivir, which is something that has with the, is a drug that now has made it to the NIH um, treatment guidelines. And certainly Corey is um, capable of speaking to that to a degree. I, you know, I don't want to stifle questions and take lots of time, but it, it may very well be worth her to just say a few words about remdesivir because it's getting a lot of attention and press right now. So Corey, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot, um, but I know it's, uh, you know, one of your, one of the things you're working diligently on currently, and it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions and issues around it. So maybe you can speak to that and, you know, might uh, might preempt somebody out there that uh, already yeah. is going to ask a question. I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked it, um, Terry, because it is on my list of questions and it has been one of my headaches. So please, Corey, what do we do about remdesivir? <laughs> Your headache and mine, Diane. <laughs> so here's the NHI got NH. NIH guidelines recommends um, or suggests using remdesivir as sort of third line treatment, right? So Paxlovid first. Uh, if you can't get Paxlovid, so Trevimab. If you can't get so Trevimab, then rem remdesivir. And they're basing their guidelines on a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That first of all, the study was done on unvaccinated individuals, <laughs> and that. The bigger issue, however, with recommending remdesivir outside the hospital setting is it's not FDA approved for use outside the hospital setting. So the position that it's put the pharmacies, the long-term care pharmacies in is that 
we don't have access to it. So it's a class of trade issue. Um, Gilead has blocked our ability to purchase remdesivir. I believe that is going to change. I don't know when, but our you know contacts at at CDC and HHS, everybody is working diligently to get Gilead to relax those uh, requirements or standards or restrictions and allow us to get access to remdesivir in our space. But remember that remdesivir is a heavy lift on the nursing staff, more so than even. IV monoclonal antibodies. It's not, you know, one and done, 30 minutes, watch them for an hour and they're, they're treated. It is a, the, the recommended, the NIH recommendations is a three-day course of, of therapy um, where the patient gets, I believe, 200 milligrams day one, um, IV, 100 milligrams day two, and 100 milligrams day three. We have to do some, you know, preliminary labs to make sure there aren't any issues. And so it's a fairly big lift on, on nursing facilities. And we you, we want to be careful with prescribing that to make sure the facility has the capability of managing that patient, do, not only just doing the IV, but watching them for adverse reactions and anaphylaxis. I mean, there is a reason why Gilead has restricted it to hospital access. So I think, you know, just once it does become available, and I'm fairly certain it will in the next month or two, we, we just need to be mindful of where we're prescribing it, which facilities. So we're watching it pretty carefully um, in constant communication with Gilead daily about access to this drug. But again, it is not available yet. And once it does become available, it's it's off-label use as well. So following the NIH guidelines is off-label use. Yeah, and that, those are the questions that we're getting, the off-label use and how are you going to cover this? And And I'm just like, you know, we'll try to figure that out. Uh, we have a question from, um, it looks like from Suzanne Sartini. I don't know if I said your, right, your name right, but what would be helpful for manufacturers and facilities during COVID? Should we not enter buildings during this time? Should we provide as much education as we can on our disease state management? What can we do to assist? And Suzanne, I'm not sure um, who you are defining as the manufacturers. Maybe you could clarify that because that is, that is, and I don't know, Corey, you look like you have a thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I did have a thought about disease state management and education, and it maybe goes back to your original question, Diane, is like, what, what have we learned from this? And I think the greatest takeaway that I have learned from all of this and, and what's gone on in our facilities over the past two years is that there is no time for disease state management education. The nursing facilities can barely take care of the patients. And, and even Jenny, to your point about documentation, I'm pretty certain that's something that is not taking a priority right now. It's getting the meds in, taking care of the patients and keeping them safe. So when we, we looked at, sort of took a step back and looked at from a clinical nursing perspective on my team, what, what can we do? We, we have these wonderful education programs, but no one has time to sit through them. And we really began to start to produce like what I'm calling in, in my nursing team, we'll go, here she goes again, but just in time learning opportunities, snippet, something that you can pull staff aside in five or 10 minutes and, and, and get, you know, just some key points away. We, we're creating quick reference guides that, that they can attach to med carts for agency staff to use. Um, you know, a lot of facilities are like, we would love for the staff to be well-educated, but when we're running 75% agency, we can't afford to educate the agency staff. So again, just in time learning, keep it quick, keep it really simple um, because nobody has time to stand there for or sit through a one hour in service. Um, it really has to be just in time learning. And, and really we, as when we're in the buildings, we look at any opportunity we can to do a stand up in service with the staff to, to just get the point across quickly and hopefully improve the care that our patients are receiving at this time. That was my key takeaway, Diane. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for our panel? Any other thoughts from our panelists? You know, I want to make sure we are we're giving people time to either write their questions or 
or take themselves off mute. I think you can do that on your own now. Um, so we, we do have that open. Diane, I was just going to mention, I know we have a lot of medical directors and consultant pharmacists on. Um, that may be the one area we haven't seen as much changeover in staff. And so as far as um, continuity of care, those two categories of uh, practitioners may have a better handle on what the patient used to look like and what they look like now. So I know, you know, as pharmacists, sometimes we may be hesitant to jump in and say, hey, it seems like Mrs. Jones used to require, you know, NEBs every now and then, and now she's requiring them routinely four times a day. Is there something going on? And providing that feedback to the other practitioners, because we may be the only ones that are seeing yeah. the patient over yeah yeah um, I think that's a great so just point. something to keep in mind yeah I think that's a great point I think um you know when you're thinking about continuity of care and who's who's most familiar and if you're the attending or the medical director and you have your long-term care pharmacist I love that point because you may be the only two people who haven't changed in the facility I also right. think that it it, it never hurts to build a very close relationship with your long-term care pharmacist. Um, I think I harassed the, the the ones who I work with via text often, but we had, you know, the best relationships because if I had a, a question or like, can I get this medication? Um, they would know that they were the person who, uh, who I could go to. So uh, to anyone who's in the, on this call, who may be a clinician to our long-term care pharmacist, please um, nurture those relationships. I think that we need to be in harmony with each other and, and, uh, and understand what, what is happening with our residents and how we can get in front of it. Um, I also think we need to be collaborating on the medical policies, <laughs> um, trying to make sure that we know when we could get whatever we could get and, and how to be better advocates. To a point that was raised about advocacy, uh, I will say um, we at FMDA, we are trying to get in front of the right people and using our platform often and, and as we can. And so we, we definitely want to do that. I do have a question that came in about using uh, vitamin C, vitamin D is zinc for COVID patients who are act, getting active treatments. And I have also seen this continue for like four to six weeks after they, they come back into a facility. So any thoughts about that? You know, what do we do with the, the, the vitamin cocktail for um, the COVID patients? Well, that's a great question. I'm sure um, lots of folks are seeing that out there um, early on. In COVID, the more severe cases in many um, instances were identified as being vitamin D deficient. Um, you know, the, on any of these agents, there aren't any good, you know, randomized clinical trials, uh, certainly, um, you know, to, to boost the D levels probably isn't necessarily a bad thing. Many of our long-term care residents um, are you know, in a way deficient. Um, you know, I don't know that you go to the the extent of, of measuring serum concentrations necessarily. Um, but I, you know, I don't believe I've seen anything that it's, it's a negative. Zinc does have some data behind it, not necessarily in COVID that it, um, you know, may, may be a preventative for um, viral infection or, um, you know, help along the course if given early. Um, you know, vitamin C is kind of in there as well as an immune support. Again, not not any really meaty data, if you will, behind all of that. Um, some theoretical and uh, in other, you know, non SARS-CoV-2 um, indications or, or viruses, maybe some efficacy, but um, you know, something that may may help, you know, in the short term and just something to remember if they don't, you know, need it long term. We don't want to give medications that, um, you know, forever if they're not necessarily needed. So just kind of a uh, diligent look over time as to whether those would need to be continued on a longer term basis. Yeah. Have you seen any um, requests for any IV effusion of, of um, 
vitamins in the facility or outside of the facilities? I've certainly heard of that I'm as not. a therapeutic option in hospitals, but Corey, I don't know that we've seen any. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't seen a request for that in about a year and a half or two years. So I don't think it was COVID related. Yeah, I've I've um, I've had a lot of I've seen a lot of requests. I've actually seen, unfortunately, some advertisements that saying that we could cure long um, COVID. Um, my take on all vitamins is that it is another pill. Uh, you know, so be be aware of that, and, and especially at our frail elderly um, residents, that it, it may not be as benign as you think it is, because you're now asking them to take yet another medication on top of what other whatever other polypharmacy. And I have not seen any studies that, to Terry's point, any studies that show really great data and that were well done and shows, you know, data across a, 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 a rather great sample of showing effectiveness or, or ch change in outcomes with some of these medications or um, vitamins and supplements. So. I think you bring up a really good point, Diane, is, is, is the polypharmacy. And um, obviously the benefit of you know, reducing the number of, of drugs we put in a patient's mouth is, is great for the patient. But also we need to look at optimizing the med pass and reducing the time the nurse is on the med pass because we just don't have the staff. So it, when you, I guess my, my key takeaway on that is when you go to prescribe something like, does the patient really need it? Can it be given once a day instead of twice a day? Just like anything you can do to, to decrease the workload on the nurse with respect to the med pass would be helping our facilities tremendously right now. Thank you, thank you. So if we have no other questions, I just wanna thank our panel. You guys have been amazing. This was a great way to start this conversation off this year. And um, you know, any last words from any of you? I would welcome it at this time. Yeah, Diane, I just I just want to dovetail um, on something but that both Jenny and you said, you know, I, I love you use the term, you know, harass my consultant pharmacists. Um, you know, we we love that. We love that type of harassment. And then, you know, I know you I know it was tongue in cheek, but please don't feel that way. That's what we're here. That's what we are here for. And that's what, you know, utilize us to the extent you need to. And, you know, we've talked a few times about collaboration and, you know, don't want to necessarily continue to to hit that. But um, it is extremely important and something we haven't talked about yet is the information is changing so rapidly, um, you know, especially in the area of, of COVID therapeutics. Um, and and Corey will laugh that whenever she puts out an update on, on monoclonals, mm -hmm there's always a statement in there in bold in the communication that says information is changing rapidly. You know, please, please make sure that uh, you're in contact with your consultant pharmacist or nurse consultant uh, to make sure you have the most up-to-date information. But really that's a way that, um, you know, medical directors and prescribers can uh, further collaborate with consultant pharmacists is that, um, you know, this, uh, this is changing monoclonal sometimes daily, um, you know, certainly weekly as um, new information and other guidance and information comes out. So really um, just to keep up to date on what's going on. I, I know I um, author the, the vaccine reference guide, COVID vaccine reference guide that, um, that Omnicare puts out. And it's, you know, it, there are changes frequently to that as there are to, you know, monoclonals and um, I'm sure there will be to oral antivirals as well. But, you know, just to make sure that, um, you know, our, our job as, as pharmacists is to keep up on uh, all the changes that are occurring and, and be aware of those and be available to help. So that's my closing thoughts. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk to your group. It's a great group. Thank you. Jenny, Corey, any other thoughts? Well, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting me back. And I think, um, you know, the three of us are happy to come back. If there are any um, additional updates regarding COVID therapeutics, we'd be happy to come back. So I invited myself back. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to echo what Corey and Terry said. Thank you so much for having us. And um, that partnership 
I think we need to, as consultant pharmacists, I'll speak for us and say we need to move beyond being paper letter generators um, and really making sure our recommendations are important and impactful and really developing that relationship with the medical director. Um, I have a few facilities still in Florida and I have the medical director's email. And anytime, you know, Terry kicks out an amazing update, I share that via email with them. So I would challenge all the other pharmacists to really build that relationship with your prescribers and get to know them. Uh, it's better for you and them and the patient. And it just provides an avenue to share that those updates that we get all the time. So thank you so much for having us and working, you know, bringing these different groups together. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Email, phone number, text, slide it to a DM, whatever you need to do. Thank you all. Have a great day. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.